So far, this flight has proved out just exactly what uh, Ed White uh, had suggested earlier from his short walk, and so far this flight has been very much like Ed White's walk, with a few exceptions. Uh, Cernan has done more out there than White did in the first American spacewalk. He uh, did uh, recover that box uh, with the micrometeorite experiment. He set up the camera. He set up that uh, mirror that you saw that will permit Stafford to watch him as he goes to the back of the spacecraft. And uh, he tested, as did Ed White, the dynamics of the umbilical cord, what happened when he pulled on it, what, what happened to the spacecraft, and so forth. And uh, now he's getting ready and is going back to the back of the spacecraft uh, to get into that uh, unit during the next 20 minutes and prepare for the further walk in space with his fully controlled maneuvering unit, a one-man spaceship. CBS News color coverage of the Gemini 9 mission will continue in a moment. As America's Gemini heroes whirl through space, they take along equipment specially designed for the Gemini space trips. Among the gear selected was this special toothbrush made by the makers of Picopay toothbrushes. This unique brush is just like the Picopay brush you'd use at home, except it's made with a specially resistant material, material to stand up to the high temperatures and oxygen levels of space. Just as this special Picopay brush goes along on Gemini flights, so this regular Picopay has become the toothbrush more dentists recommend. You see, Picopay was professionally designed to do the best possible job of cleaning your teeth. Every feature was designed to fight cavities. Handle, head, even the tufts are tapered deeper to clean deeper where cavities often start. So remember, for the best possible job of cleaning your teeth, get Picopay, the toothbrush recommended by more dentists.
So after about seven years now of tumbling down this little rabbit hole and digging through old NASA footage and archived clips of things, I keep coming across stuff that I had not yet seen before, and this was a pretty fascinating one from June of 1966, the Gemini 9 mission, which was the second American spacewalk, allegedly, and even when you go and read the Wikipedia page, it doesn't mention anything about the fact that in the studio with Walter Cronkite behind him, they set up a full-size <laughs> mock-up of uh, the, the space capsule and uh, the Agena capsule that they were supposed to rendezvous with. It was all about preparing for the Apollo missions, and so they were practicing how to do their rendezvous, just the two craft that would dock with each other, right? And so somehow they didn't have the cameras working, or it wasn't... So the, 1966, three years before we uh, got all the way to the moon and broadcast it live and had a live phone call with the White House and all this other stuff, somehow that, that wasn't up and going yet, so they had to reenact it all in the studio for the viewing audience to be able to visualize what they were really doing up there, you know, flying around the, the globe at 17,000 miles an hour, hanging out the door, testing the rope. I mean, it's, it's kind of hilarious. I probably don't have to uh, spell out why this is one of those uh, broadcasts that they would totally love to just completely memory hole because it, it's pretty, pretty ridiculous. But this is, uh, this is like two hours long, two hours of him just sitting there listening to his earpiece and and they're playing the radio chatter of Cernan and and the other guy who are supposedly up there doing the exact same thing that they're reenacting for you in the studio nothing fishy right nothing that i mean how could you question this right and then the next mission that came after this they they did have footage that they uh, were able to put together somehow so but not a live feed that that was still had to wait for the moon i guess you can do a live feed from the moon, but not from low Earth orbit. And of course you got good old Bohemian Grove, Walter Cronkite at the helm, proud to serve Satan for the globalists and all that, so. You can find the whole thing on archive.org and uh, it's even got the original TV commercial breaks and, and everything. Come on, help fight that bad guy, boredom. Can be great in an old 88. They say it's a, it was, he says color, color broadcast, but it's not a color, so I don't know what. Some of the commercials are in color, but not, not the news coverage. But, uh, I got a kick out of this, and I figured you guys would too. And, um, the interesting thing is that, uh, I found this when I was starting to try and prepare kind of a response to a video that a number of people mentioned and, and pointed out to me and were asking about that uh, Mike Winger did not too long ago with uh, these guys from the Cultish podcast, which I'd not really heard of before, but I'm vaguely familiar with Winger. Uh, he's a pastor who has a YouTube channel and kind of just talks about, you know, Bible stuff, and uh, he's real big on just, what does the Bible say? And so they had a two-hour podcast conversation about it, and um, that was kind of his whole his whole approach was saying, I, I don't want to get into science, I don't want to get into NASA, I don't want to debate all that, I just want to look at what the Bible says. And, you know, does the Bible teach Flat Earth? And so, I'm not going to play any clips or anything, because there wasn't really much that was super clippable. It was kind of, it was really slow to listen to, actually. But I did try and kind of take some some brief notes, and um, it's prompted a lot of thought over the past week or so, as I've thought about it, because, to be honest, it, it did kind of irritate me in, <laughs> in a few different ways but trying to really think about like what it was specifically because most of it was nothing really new i'm just kind of appealing to the common refrain of well this is poetic language and you're being too literal and uh you know he's, he spends a lot of time talking about the verses that speak to the ends of the earth and trying to refute the idea that this is literally describing a, like a flat disc where there's an end to it and you can't go you know the ice wall and, and all that and just saying, you know, it's just poetic language for like really far away, the farthest reaches of of the world and such, of the of the habitable land. And you know, overall, it was interesting because everything from like kind of the thumbnail, you know, a message to my flat Earth friends, and then a lot of the the phrasing and everything, it, it was definitely 
at least on the surface level, attempting to be kind of conciliatory, I think, and, uh, you know, not just being outright shameless mockery, as is often the case. So I did want to kind of at least acknowledge that and go, well, maybe that's a, a step in the right direction, at least, in terms of, like, you know, we can have these conversations without being mean-spirited and, and just mocking the other side. So I did appreciate that. I will say, though, that towards the end, there was kind of some stuff that started to slip out to where it's like, yeah, there. I don't know. I don't know how sincere the attempt to, to avoid, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you still see it as kind of just a, a, a joke and you can't, you know, then you're not going to be able to hide it. But overall, I was kind of glad I did all that and listened to it because... As I said, it made me think a lot about, like, what is what is really at the core of why this is so aggravating, especially after, yeah, how many years of this conversation being out, you know, in the, the internet uh, marketplace of ideas or whatever. And Winger actually basically did, he did a video two years ago and just had all the same points and all the same quote-unquote biblical arguments uh as then, and nothing's really changed. So, it just, it, part of me is kind of like, yeah, it's pretty interesting that out of all the things going on in the world, especially in the name of science versus pseudoscience, that this, this out of everything else, this is still something that's so, so important to biblically refute, right? Especially when it's, you know, the, the, the cultish podcast, you know, that's a big, their big focus is like exposing cults, right? Which is like, okay, that's, that's great. You know, there's definitely a lot of cults out there, but it is, I gotta admit it, it's kind of weird when, so you know all about Mormonism and the Jehovah's Witnesses and whatever, the Manson family and, you know, different whatever else. I didn't go through all their stuff, but yeah. So they did this podcast and they wrote a few blog posts, uh, one of them talking about why firmament isn't even a real word. It's, it's just a Latin, you know, creation that's been kind of seized upon to create this idea that, you know, the firmament is firm and hard. You know, that rakia, when rakia just means it expanse, according to them, and all this kind of stuff. So... Yeah, this whole question, right? This is supposedly he says, I don't want to deal with any of that other stuff. I just I just want to focus on the Bible. Like what does the Bible say? You know, does the Bible teach flat earth? And then that being the way you frame the question, I mean that in itself, I would say <laughs> that's a, that's a question that nobody would frame would even come up with without comparing it against the globe model of earth. And of course, that's the real distinction there. I mean, d does the Bible really try and even answer that? And I would say, no, it, it, it more or less basically just assumes that it's flat and doesn't really bother trying to point out something that's apparent from e everywhere you look in the world. But that gets into the whole, this whole argument we've heard many, many times about, well, God's just using phenomenological language to describe, you know, things like Joshua's long day, or the whole book of Genesis. So first of all, you're doing a, a discussion on what does the Bible teach about the earth and you don't even read Genesis. You just go through all these proof texts that you think are the ones that flat earthers like to use. And, you know, it's all about, oh, we're going to go back and put them in context, right? Which I would say they do not really do at all. Whether it's uh, verses in the book of Job when, you know, the whole point that God is saying over and over again through many chapters towards the end of Job is he's he's basically mocking the idea that man can measure the earth and know <laughs> what all these things are that he's talking about. You know, where were you when I made all these things? And, uh, you know, one of the things they went into was the bars and the doors of um, the seas, right? And they just started kind of like going on about like, how okay, so you go to the beach and you don't see any bars or doors that stop the oceans from only going this far and no, no further. So clearly it's, this is a, you know, poetic language. And I was actually surprised that they were even making that argument because I've never even heard that before when personally I, I do think that it's very possible that there are literal bar, you know, doors or openings or, you know, waterways both below the earth and, and above the earth that can open and close, whether you call them windows of heaven or springs of the deep or different things like that that are literal openings, just like, uh, you know, if you turn on the faucet in your bathtub and start letting the water fill up until it, you know, goes to the back and just goes higher and higher. And then if you turn it off again, <laughs> that's the door that's telling the water how far it can go, no further, right? So the idea that the door is, like, on the beach, I thought was, uh, like, wow. But really, you can get in all these, like, kind of little things, all these little details, and they did mention, uh, you know, the, the verse in Revelation where the stars fall from heaven like figs, and again, that's just... You can just write anything off as poetic language, 
right? And say, oh, no, that's not what God really meant. He's just, you know, he was speaking in the terms that they could understand at the time, but now that we're, you know, we're so advanced and we know differently. And the argument is to try and say that, yeah, the Bible was describing this whole globe floating in space system all along. They just didn't understand it then, but we do now. But it's all because of the Bible, right? It's... <laughs> So never mind the fact that you basically have to just pretend like the entire saga of, you know, the whole scientific revolution and the Copernican revolution. I, I don't know why there was a revolution if supposedly the Bible was teaching this all along and people knew this all along. I mean, that, that's kind of a major unavoidable obstacle in posing that question just right out of the gate. Like, if the Bible doesn't teach this, then why do all, why do we, like, this isn't even debated. That, like, yes, the people who were alive, the patriarchs and the authors of the Bible all believed in some form of this enclosed, archaic, flat, enclosed cosmology. So that kind of puts the onus on you to explain, like, how the Bible was really teaching something completely different for thousands of years. And none, none of those people who were actually led by the Spirit of God to write those words were able to come up with the interpretation that now, supposedly, people in the 20th and 21st century are pretending like they're getting from it without any of all this other uh, influence, which we will get back to. But here's what uh, here's what kind of struck me, though, is that, yeah, debating the, the question of does the Bible teach that the earth is flat is itself a nonsensical question if you're ignoring, <laughs> if you're ignoring the, the entire Copernican, heliocentric, scientific, NASA progression of cosmology. You wouldn't even think to ask the question. It wasn't even a thing. And up until Pythagoras, so somehow Pythagoras gets all the credit for what was in the Bible all along and just the people who wrote the Bible were oblivious. But guys like Pythagoras, who was probably one of the most influential occultists in, in all of history, somehow he was able to put that together without God's help. But here's the thing. Here's what, here's what I really want to emphasize is that the, the real que there's a lot of questions that I think would be better than asking, does the Bible teach the earth is flat? I think the question that's way more fundamental than that is, how many worlds does the Bible teach? How many worlds are there? And whether you go through the Old Testament or the New Testament, and you're looking at the Hebrew, you're looking at the Greek, looking at it in context, or whether in the context of what is being said in the particular verse and chapter and book, or if you just do a across, you know, across the scripture word study and look at them all kind of one after the other, no matter how you slice it, I challenge anyone to go into the Bible and read what it says. Any times it talks about the world or the heavens and the earth, if it ever speaks of there being other worlds in any way that actually impacts your theology, that impacts your eschatology, that impacts your Christology, that impacts your epistemology. I mean, anything that goes underneath the umbrella of what we call the gospel. How does this idea that there are not just the world, the earth, with the heavens above, but there's other worlds, why is that something that is so crucial to be part of your paradigm, to be part of your quote-unquote biblical cosmology, even though, yeah, after seven years of looking into this topic specifically and decades of, you know, growing up in the church, being in missions, having visited dozens of different denominations and listened to countless sermons, I've never heard anything within the realm of Christianity that actually hinged upon the belief in some otherworldly realm or reality or planet or moon or spaceship just traveling through the, the void or getting sucked into a black hole. I, not one, not a single one. The whole, the whole, from beginning to end, if you were looking at what the Bible talks about it, all the action is here from beginning to end. From the Garden of Eden, to the flood, to the calling out of Abraham, to the coming of the Messiah, his death and resurrection, he goes up into the clouds, like literally his body, his resurrected body physically goes up into the sky. Is that being poetic? Or is that, are we being too literal if we believe that? Was it just phenomenologically it looked like Jesus was ascending, but there's really some scientific explanation for why they saw that? Where did he go? 
yeah, man, it, it, it irritates me. But this is what is interesting is because when I started doing this and I was thinking about this question of like how many, is there just, does the Bible just refer to the world as if like it's just the world? Like there's just one or is it just one among, you know, billions out there as science would absolutely insist that there's nothing special, that there's nothing central, there's nothing unique about the earth in the cosmos. And it's an interesting word that we talk about cosmos, we talk about cosmology with all of this, and that word cosmos shows up in the Bible quite a bit. <laughs> and when we you say the word cosmos now, we think of it in the Carl Sagan uh, sense, like the universe, namely a Big Bang expanding, swirling, you know, radioactive universe, self-assembling universe. But um, this word cosmos in the New Testament is just translated the world like over and over and over again. <laughs> so how many cosmos, so it's interesting that we talk about the, every every time you hear a Bible commentator, they always say something like, yeah, it's the creation, it's the world, it's, it's the whole, the totality of creation, so i.e. the universe. But show me an instance in the Bible where cosmos is actually used in a way that could mean the whole universe, and you will find time and time again, this is actually incredibly problematic, and it kind of messes up the theological point of any of its usages because it's interchangeably used to mean the world in which we live the the physical realm the the ground the water the trees everything the habitable land the world whatever shape you want to believe it is and the heavens above it's a whole system right but then the scripture also uses the word cosmos to talk about the kingdoms of this world and even says that you know satan is the god of this world do not love the world or anything in the world all these verses that we're very familiar with are all using the word cosmos, which is kind of strange when, so in that sense, the Bible uses it to describe the kingdoms and the systems and the, the mindsets and, you know, the institutions of men. So it is this worldly system. Sometimes it's just translated worldliness. Cosmos. Which is a really strange thing when, if you think about that cosmos is not just supposed to represent this one little ball suspended in space amongst zillions of others. That somehow, like, the ways of this world, <laughs> how are the kingdoms of this cosmos only on this little, you know, is there other kingdoms? Is there other world? Same thing when you talk about the gospel going out to the ends of the earth, and then the end will come. How does that even make sense if... The ends of the earth is just, well, that's just poetic language to mean the end of, like, you know, the continents and whatever. You believe it's a ball and you can you can go as as far one way to the end of the ball. The end, there's only as a finite amount of habitable land, right? That's it's the same idea. But the Bible talks about the ends of the earth as being, like, as far as you can go. <laughs> and yet the whole concept of this, this whole space narrative is that, no, that's not as far as you can go. The ends of the earth is just, that's just the launching off point. That's just, that was the old frontier. Now we have the new frontier that goes out in every direction. But does the Bible describe such a thing? How, how does that make sense for the gospel to go out into the ends of the earth as if that's some sort of final accomplishment or the saints being gathered from the far corners of the earth, you know, and you sitting here quibbling over, well, how does corners work on a, you know, circular disc and this kind of stuff, completely just ignoring the fact that, what about the people off the earth? What about Mars colonies and space stations and, you know, all the stuff that they're so keen to do that it's just going to, you know, any day now, any very soon, this idea that like, oh yeah, no, just, we're just, we just believe in this just because of the Bible. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> give me a break, dude. And, I'm, you know, I could rehash a bunch of stuff from the Enlightenment, but that's kind of what I've been doing for many years now. Where did all these concepts come from? Who did think up the idea of going to another heavenly body? Or that they even could be places that you could physically go in, a, in some kind of space train shot out of a cannon or whatever. <laughs> does, does the Bible suggest that we can uh, ascend to the heavens? So I would say no. The Bible describes one world, one cosmos, one earth, everything in Genesis 1 should be enough to kind of establish that. <laughs> but no, we want to say, yeah, he made the sun and the moon, and then he made the stars also. And in that one little phrase, it's like 99.99999% of the cosmos was actually created. Yet he just spends the rest of the whole book, the whole Bible, just talking about 
the the spec, the really important spec, suspended in a sunbeam. Also, it's curious that the the sun would be distinguished from the you know really the sun is just another star, but he made the sun first. He made our star first, and it's just really close up. So, to make Genesis conform to a Copernican cosmology, you have to start shoehorning like right out of the gate. So again, is the flatness question really what even matters? Is that even really what is so important? Or is it the distinction between, no, there's just one world. If you want to think of it as a globe, go ahead, fine. Think of it as a globe. And I really don't care. I mean, that makes no difference to me is you'd still be talking about a globe that you are never going to leave. And whatever we see above our heads is not something that we're ever going to explore and colonize and harvest, uh, you know, resources from and, and all this. We're certainly never going to escape our destiny of humanity and facing the judgment and wrath of God by escaping to some other world. So yes, this whole idea that like, you just want to use the Bible to argue that we're really a, a globe spinning in this giant vacuum orbiting around the sun as the sun orbits around the Milky Way as the Milky Way, you know, flies outward from, you know, the center of the galaxy and all this. But it just, it brings me back to the question of like, why is this such a weird, controversial topic? If it's like, I yeah, after seven years, I still have yet to hear any pastor or theologian or creationist professional, you know, creationist apologist, anyone explain why this whole, you know, 99 point whatever percent of the universe, the cosmos, why this is so important to the gospel or the biblical narrative or or anything that the Bible talks about happening past, present, or future. I've yet to hear it. But we just got to stamp it out, right? We got to stamp this out. And really, I think it comes back down to this question of, of cosmos in the biblical sense of the world. This is what it's really about. It's really not about what is the exact shape of the ground that you're working on. Does water really just go on on a perfect plane or does it eventually curve around in a way that's you can't you can't distinguish with your naked eye, but it's really important for you to know that it does that. It's really important for you to know that there's like moons orbiting Jupiter and whatever else. Does it have any immediate import? How does it translate into faith in any capacity other than our concept of our faith and the systems of this world, the cosmos, the kingdoms of this cosmos, the cosmology of man, as it were, which is about way more than just stars and planets and all these galactic concepts that are put in our heads since we were children. It, it really, the reason why it's so controversial is it tests our assumptions of how much man knows collectively. That's what this whole scientism thing is about. Humanity believing that, you know, we're going to know everything there is to know and we can solve the, you know, the mysteries of life and death themselves. And that's literally what we've been trying to do. We've gone so far beyond just planting flags on a alleged moon surface to, oh yeah, now we've mapped the human genome and we're smashing together subatomic particles in these particle accelerators and finding smaller and smaller subatomic things. And we're going to map and model every tiny little micron of creation to the point now where like yes everything is just energy everything is just particles that are bound together by these ever-evolving laws of physics but it's amazing to me because if you believe that there really is a god that there really is a creator that that's the most significant difference in any quote-unquote model right the fact that you believe a god exists a supernatural being who created all that exists if that alone doesn't make you stop and realize it wh wow there are <sighs> There is a limit to how much humanity can put under a microscope or examine with your telescope or put into a computer model and map it all out. And so hopefully we'd all agree on that. But then the question is, is like, how far does that really go in terms of the rest of creation? Because that was what was interesting about Winger and these cultish guys is that they were talking about the verse in Revelation where the angels of the four winds stand at the four corners of the earth and hold back, you know, the winds from blowing on the earth and they were kind of kind of poking fun at the idea of that of, yeah taking that too literally as well and holding back the wind as if you know how again how are there corners on an earth and i'm sitting there there were several of these right where they're talking they're they're trying to kind of like smirk at the idea of 
being too literal about some element of, you know, whether it was like the winds or the rain or the ocean or the stars. And yet in these verses, they're, they're talking about angels, right? So I'm going like, okay, so all this stuff is poetic language, but we've also, scientifically speaking, angels are not something we can prove exists in any sort of way. And while many people have seen them and we have eyewitness accounts up to the present day, just like we do in scripture, the reason we know they exist is because of God's word, not because of our collective human study of them or, you know, proving that there's no, like, forget about it. So <laughs> it was just kind of, it just kind of hit me as bizarrely ironic that like in verses that are literally talking about angels that are literal beings, according to the Bible, you're, you're laughing at the idea of being literal about the cosmos. And to me, it's pretty clear that, yeah, they're, they're somehow interacting and they're involved in the, the functions and activities of the world, whether it's weather or earthquakes or all kinds of stuff. So I think that's really what it comes down to. And so the idea of co the cosmos, <laughs> the ways of the world, is really what's at the core of it all. And really, I think, is kind of the nerve that this whole flat earth topic is really hitting. It's not because it's like... Because, again, most, most flat earthers now know more about Copernican cosmology and NASA and all that than you're the person who's like laughing at the idea that it could be fake. Hands down. It wasn't something I thought about until I was actually challenged that. You know, I didn't, I didn't watch this stuff. But here we are in 2022, and there's still millions of professing Christians who are just downright delusional about the kingdoms of this cosmos and who's really running them and the agendas that are really at work and um, like to the point of where it's just, it's, it's just getting painful to have friends and family who I know, I don't doubt their, their belief, but it's like getting them to question anything about like, hey, maybe these institutions, maybe... <laughs> Maybe this cosmos. Uh, first of all, what do I? What do I? I don't want to be presumptuous Buzz. here. I can call you Buzz. Buzz. Okay. That's a, that's a legal name. Passport. Okay. Driver's license. And I am Uncle Coney tonight. Uh, Uncle Coney. Well, let's talk about this because this is fascinating. I remember very clearly. I think anybody who was alive at the time does. I remember my parents waking me up and we went down and we watched you guys land on the moon. No, which you didn't. Was, no, you didn't. What? Because uh, uh, there wasn't any television. There wasn't anybody taking a picture. You watched animation. So you associated what you saw with... I have very hazy memories. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, well, no, but what we saw was we all, we all were gathered around heard, the old curved top heard radio me and listened. talking about, uh, you know, how many feet we were going to the left and right, and then I said, contact light, engine stop, and it's a exciting. few other things, and then Neil said, Houston, Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed. This was Man, how about that? That, that was that, very exciting. Not a bad line. Yeah, yeah. This was <laughs> you watch animation. See, you associated what you saw with... I have very hazy memories. Uh, no, uh. Off into space. Man, that takes real teamwork. And here's a team of junior spacemen with an out-of-this-world breakfast that teams up V8 juice and Cheerios for flavor and energy. What a treat! A flavorful glassful of refreshing V8 juice and Cheerios with power protein, plus vitamin B1 for goal power. And now, here's a special out-of-this-world free offer. This moon rocket kit, both a toy and an exciting game. First, blast off!